a two-part series as we enter into 2015. This is our first Sunday of 2015. As we enter into this new year, we're going to be entering into a fast. And uh, so therefore, the title of these first two messages are Reconcile 2015 Fast. And today I want to talk about worship the king. Uh, worship, worship the king. If you're at Matthew chapter 2, would you just say amen? You know, you might suppose that the earliest worshipers of Jesus would have been the people that were in power, the people that were of privilege. In Jesus' time, the people who would have gotten any new news first would have typically been the people who were in power or the people that were in privilege. Whatever was going on in the province that they had authority over would quickly be communicated to them. So typically the people who were most powerful, who were the most privileged, got information first. So you might suspect that the earliest worshipers of Jesus would have been people of power and privilege, but it wasn't. You might suspect that the earliest worshipers of Jesus would have surely been the religious people, the scholars, the, the teachers of the law, those that knew the Old Testament, that knew the Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. You would suspect that the earliest worshipers of Jesus would have been the people who had the privilege of the revelation of God in their hands. You would suspect that the earliest worshipers of Jesus were the ones that were scouring the scriptures, looking for the coming Messiah. Surely all the books, the first five books of the Bible, were all pointing to the Messiah coming. So you would suspect that those that would have been there earliest to worship Jesus would have been those who were the religious scholars, the teachers, the lawyers, but they weren't. In fact, the earliest worshipers of Jesus were the most unlikely people on the entire planet. The earliest worshipers of Jesus were what were known as the Magi. They popularly were known as the wise men, but you have to understand what Magi were. The earliest worshipers of Jesus were those people that have come from over a thousand miles away in Persia and they traveled and came to Bethlehem from Persia, and these were men that were astrologers, sorcerers, diviners, people who were forbidden by the Old Testament scriptures were some of the first people that responded to the call to come worship the king. The people of privilege were intimidated by a new king coming. I've got privilege, I've got power, I've got position, I've got control over people's lives, I'm threatened that a king of kings has come. Maybe I'll lose my position and my power, therefore I won't worship him. The people who were only five to seven miles away, right there in Jerusalem, it's an easy, quick walk or donkey ride to come to Bethlehem, but those people who knew the scriptures so well and saw the prophecy of the Messiah right in the scriptures, they were indifferent. They were cool, they, their hearts were lukewarm, they weren't in passionate pursuit to come worship the Messiah because they were more in relationship with the kings than they were ready to be with the king of kings. And the funny thing is that a lot of that is still true today. A lot of us don't come and passionately pursue to worship the king because we're afraid that relationship with him might make me lose control over my life or control over the people who I think I have control over. So we're kind of like those privileged people. It's still true today. You would expect that those who had the knowledge of the scriptures, who knew verses and passages in the Bible, would be the ones that were the first to gatherings, the first to service, the first to prayer, the most radical for Jesus. But no, over time, I know what it says, and I've cooled and become lukewarm in my passion to him. I'm not overly pursuing, let the young new Christians do that, but you know, as they, as they get more mature, they won't be as radical and as uh, abandoned in their pursuit of worship for Jesus. So even to this day, God calls some of the most unlikely people 
to provoke us at some of the most unlikely times. Yes. And we've got to be careful this year not to get in the way of some of the people that God's going to bring through that door, to get in the way of some of the people that God's going to bring to the altar, to get in the way to some of the people that are going to show up in our peace cells because there'll be people coming that don't know all the form and fashion, but they'll come with a passion that will make you ashamed. They'll, 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 come, they'll come with an abandon that will end up provoking us and awaking us. Truth be told, I pray that doesn't happen. I pray that they come and find a group of people so radical and abandoned that they'll realize I'm right at home. I, I knew how to be wild in my old life, and now I've found some people that are wild in the new life. We got to worship the king. Are you ready for this? Let's open up to Matthew chapter 2, Matthew's gospel chapter 2. I want to read several verses. I'm going to read the first 16 verses, so dig in there with me. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, or magi, from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. In some versions, it says rumors spread throughout Jerusalem when these men came. And when, and when he had gathered, speaking of Herod, verse 4, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Interestingly enough, in verse 5, they knew exactly. They said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written, they took him right to the word of God, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily or secretly called the wise men, the magi, inquired of them diligently, what time the star appeared? When did you first see this star appear? Verse eight, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. That's important, young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed and lo, or immediately, or it showed up again, the star, which they saw in the east, which before them, which uh, east went before them till it come and it stood over where the young child was. In other words, when they went into the king, they couldn't see the star. When they came out, the star appeared again and the star went and like a supernatural GPS just parked right over the house where Jesus was. God, you're awesome. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. What other response could there be? And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. But when we get on our teaching in diversity, there's going to be some incredible insight about the fact that the baby Jesus left Bethlehem and God sent him into Africa, into Egypt. And that's where he first was. Just some incredible stuff there. But we won't do that today. Verse 15, and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Verse 16, finally, Then Herod 
when he saw that he was mocked of the magi or the wise men, was exceeding raw and sent forth, and listen to this, slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. A massive genocide, infanticide, massively. You thought abortion has destroyed many, and it has, but the king issued an edict to kill all the male babies in all of Bethlehem and the surrounding area, the countryside, the coast thereof, from two years old and under. Because that was about the age that they figured Jesus was, because that's when the star first arose, according to the Magi. According to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. So what is all this? Typically, we don't hear a message like this unless it's December 21st going into Christmas. Why would you bring these passages up now to kick off the new year? Isn't that a Christmas message, Pastor? No, this is a kingdom message. In fact, we've picked to share it, or I should say God has picked for us to share it after Christmas, so it would be like a star. It would get our attention. It would awaken our hearts and say, why are we looking at these passages now? Let's, let's look at the first few verses here. It says, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came who? From the east. I did some study from the east. They came all the way from Persia. It was about, uh, their maps weren't great, but it was about 1,000 to 1,200 miles away. These men, when they first saw that star, God revealed to them that a son was being born, that the king of kings was being born, and those magi, 1,200 or 1,000 or so miles away, got up and began the journey following that star. These were not Christian men. These, or should I say, these were not religious men. These were not men who understood the, the Old Testament. These were not men who were studied in the scriptures. In fact, these were men that would be more like tarot card readers and astrology guys and diviners that brought up spirits from the dead. These were men that literally were practicing the forbidden arts. <laughs> people that were doing spiritual things that were dark things, and it's incredible that God, by his spirit, would reveal himself to these men, and these men would immediately get up and start to pursue. Make a note of that. Verse 2, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to do what? Let me define some things. See, reconcile, and this is Reconcile 2015, how does God reconcile? How does God bring humanity back into agreement with his plans, his intents, his desires? How does God reconcile? How does he take our lives, which we think we know, which we have organized in a certain way, and the activities we've gotten ourselves involved in, how does he reconcile us and bring us back into harmony with his plan? <laughs> Look at these astrologers. They're as far away from God as you can be. They're at a place as dark as a person could be. These, if I, if I can, were more like Satan worshipers than anything else. And here, God takes the darkest heart and shows his ability to reconcile them to himself. And it's key how he does it. How does God bring us from where we are to agreement? How does he bring us from where we are to harmony? How does he bring us from what we've attached ourselves to to restore us to being attached to him, which is where he wanted us to be? It's easy. He reveals himself. How does God reconcile? He reveals himself. These men were studying, doing what they do, looking at the stars, following astronomy, having people come. They were soothsaying, doing all the things they did in Persia. And God, as they're looking at a star, reveals to them a star they've never seen before. A star brighter than anyone they've seen before. And he comes in their darkness and shows them this star and then speaks to them by spirit, reveals a truth to them that that is the star that will take you to the king of kings. You guys have been in pursuit of power. You've been in, in pursuit of clarity. You've been in pursuit of understanding. This is why people are spiritual. You've been in pursuit of these things. I'm going to show you a star that shows you the understanding of all things. 
and he comes and gets the most unlikely ones, and here they are almost two years later on their journey. That's how long their journey took. That's passion. Almost two years later, here they show up in Bethlehem, and they're asking around, where is the king? We've been traveling. We've been journeying. We've been in pursuit. We've been passionate since he revealed himself to us. And every step they were taking, God was reconciling these men who were far from God. He was bringing them close to himself. And how did he do it? By revealing himself. And when God reveals himself to us, there are one of three reactions that we will have. This is true from 2,000 years ago, and it's true in 2015. It's true right here now at this particular moment in time. When God reveals himself to us, he's revealing himself to bring us into agreement, to bring us into harmony, to make us compatible, to bring us to a place where we're restored to what he wants in that moment in time in our lives. But when he reveals himself to us, since we have a will, there's one of three ways we might react. You should write this down. The first way is to react like the Magi did. The Magi got up, they put down what they were doing, and they pursued. The first way to respond when God reveals himself to me is to pursue the truth he has shown me. I'll say it again. The first way that I can respond to this three is that when God reveals himself to me, I can pursue the truth he has shown me. Did you write that down? But there's a second way that I can respond. The second way I can respond is that when God reveals himself to me, when God shows me and exposes me to himself, if I don't pursue, I can also be apathetic. I can also be cool to it. I can also be like, well, that's nice. That's interesting. And I can walk around and be knowledgeable, but the knowledge can keep me right where I'm at. I can be kind of like the, the chief scribes were. They knew something, but it hadn't moved them at all. It didn't provoke any passion. It didn't provoke any movement. It didn't provoke any change. They just knew something. God's trying to bring them into agreement, but they only do it with their heads. They never do it with their hearts and their feet. There's a third way that I can respond to God revealing himself to me. Why does he reveal himself to me? Because he wants to reconcile me to himself. The third way that I can respond is with anger, with rebellion, with hatred, with why would you ask me to do that? Why would you show that to me? Why would you let this happen to me? Why would you want me to do that? You can't possibly want that from me. I'm comfortable right where I'm at. The last time I followed you, this happened, and I can respond with disdain and anger and hatred. Because I'm comfortable right where I'm at, even though I'm not where he wants me to be, even though I'm not in the best place, even at least I'm comfortable and familiar with where I am. God, how dare you ask me to use faith again and get up and move again? I don't want to do that. It didn't go the way I wanted. I hate the fact you're bringing this up. And I work hard to dig myself in. I work hard to defend my position. I work hard to set up a barrier, maybe sometimes subconsciously, but set up a barrier around myself and God. Maybe it wasn't God at all. Maybe I just stayed up too long. Are you ready for this? Kick off the year, Lord. Verse 3. When Herod the king heard these things, what? When God revealed to Herod, when God gave Herod a chance to be reconciled to God, right? When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem, it was rumored throughout Jerusalem, they were, they were troubled. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor and shall rule my people Israel. 
Then Herod, when he had secretly or privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time or when the star first appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard or when they finished listening to the king, they departed and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. These pagan sinners were responding to the call of God. God revealed himself to them, and they got up, and they were in desperate pursuit to find God. They were in desperate pursuit to find Christ. When God starts revealing himself, they responded desperately. But they bumped into people that responded in the other two ways. They went to Bethlehem, and then they bumped into King Herod, and King Herod played like he wanted to know where Christ was, but you're of the privileged people. This isn't the first time this information has come across your desk, but now that you see that it must be real, it must be alive, there's a king of the Jews. I'm king of the Jews. And then Herod has to literally go to the people who are the religious scholars and wake them up out of their dusty basement and say, hey, is this true? He calls a secret meeting with what would have been the church at that time and said, hey, I heard from these magi that Jesus has come, that the Messiah has come, the king of kings has come. He's entered into the earth. Where is he? And they go in the scriptures and find and say he's in Bethlehem. Isn't it so sad that they knew where he was, but they still stayed seven miles away because it wasn't enough to get them up to go pursue. Isn't it sad that they, they literally worked for the king rather than taking the opportunity to work for the king of kings? Herod was the one that had to call them to get them to go into their scriptures. That can be us sometimes. I don't really dig into pursuing God real hard unless something happens with my king. Some of us, our king is our job. If something happens with my job, then yeah, I'll press in the God. I got to worship God. I got to see God now. I'm desperate for God now. But you're not really responding to the king of kings. You're responding to your king. Sometimes I just need some more money, and I got to get some more stuff, and they need to pay me right, and, and that's my king, more money. And, and now that more money ain't coming, my king causes me to become passionate. I now dig in and look. But there's a higher calling to worship. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with jobs. I'm certainly not saying there's anything wrong with resources. What I'm saying is they're not kings. They, they cannot lord over our lives. If they do, they'll rob us of our passion. They'll make us have things to protect and defend. They'll make us be cold towards God because you can't love two masters. You'll, you'll, you'll love one and despise the other or else you'll cling to one and be not enough committed to the other. But you can't give a whole heart commitment to any more than one king. And here are the magi who are men that have never heard good preaching, never heard good teaching, never heard the rabbi get up and expound on the scriptures and open up the scroll and read to them. They've never heard anything like that. But they show us an example of what we worshiping him in spirit and in truth looks like. To worship God in spirit is he's revealed something to me. I'm not quite clear on exactly what it is, but it pushes me to scour the scriptures. It, it pushes me to ask questions. It pushes me to my knees in prayer. It pushes me to get in the presence of God. It pushes me to say, God, finish showing me what you just revealed to me there. I got to know it. I got to know you more fully. I got to know myself more fully. To worship him in spirit and in truth is I'm pursuing him with my heart, my head, and my passion. I've got to see what he's saying. You, you got to get this. We can't just be motivated to worship because of stuff. We've got to get the heart of the magi. We've got to get the heart of the wise men. As we're entering into this year, we're entering in with the fast because a fast provokes passion. 
We're entering in with the fast because the fast makes me turn off to all my other pursuits and it makes me become more synergy, more focused, more connected, more in pursuit of God. We're starting the year with the fast because we've picked up some appetites that we must kill now. We picked up some desires that are competing too much with the one desire that must rule our lives. We're starting with a fast because we got to get purged. We've got to get cleansed. We got to get on our priestly garments. God needs us in this hour. We've gotten too involved with civilian affairs. He needs to snatch us out of being in civilian affairs for civilian purposes and put us in civilian affairs for kingdom purposes. We've we got to start with the fast. We've got to get the heart of the magi, the heart of the wise men. Are, are you ready for this? Look at verse 16. Look at that. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And in all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. See, Herod responded to the revealing of truth from God with outrage. Herod responded to the revealing of the truth that God had. He felt threatened by the truth. If God is changing things, then things are going to change for me. I like where I am. I like what I'm doing. I like what I have. I like the respect that people give me. I like my business card. I like my car. I like where I live. I like the control that I have over things. Those people will fight violently when God reveals truth. And violence shows up all different kinds of ways. I don't go there no more because Pastor Kev is a heretic. I listen to him preach. You should be careful. I don't like his message. Nobody's ever said that, but that's a violent response to revealing. You see? So I will attack the one who was revealing because I don't want nothing else revealed to me so I can try to cheapen what God said. Are you following me? Well, you can't really trust the scriptures. What version of the Bible was being used when that truth was revealed to you? And maybe you need to go back to another, and now I start studying all kinds of weird and crazy stuff. But what I'm really doing is violently responding to what God revealed, because I don't want to do what he said, so I'm going to try to make it that God didn't say that. Another way I violently respond is I go get other people's opinions. I prayed and asked God, should I do this? God has revealed to me that I shouldn't. Of course, I don't start off my conversation with that, but I go to other people and say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about me doing this? And I was thinking about approaching it that way. And then you get four or five or six people, respectable people that say, I think that's a great idea. Although God has already revealed to you, no. But my violent response is to go get a gang and gang up against what God said. That's a violent response. Herod responded so violently that he used his realm of authority to do what he could. He knew that Jesus was around two years old or younger at that time, so he used his power to get every baby killed. You wonder about some of the things that our government is doing now. You wonder about some of the things that people in authority are doing right now. In many cases, even unbeknownst to them, what they're doing is fighting against the reconciling plan of God. And God is trying to raise up men and women that would have the courage to stand up against some of those things to bring our governments, to bring our systems, to bring our world more in alignment with him. He's looking for courageous magi that would travel 1,200 miles and not be impressed by no king who invites them into a private meeting. I mean, after all, they traveled 1,200 miles to seek God. They could have fooled themselves into thinking, see, this is must, must have been what God had in mind. We're in a special meeting with the king now. Yeah, he, he secretly wanted to meet with us, and you know he laid out all his royal privilege. You know he had the best singers in there singing and the best instrument players playing, and he gave them the best wine he had and the best food he had. You know he was seducing them to show them how powerful he was so that he could get the information he wanted out of the Magi. You know how kings do. Kings don't invite you in and give you a TV dinner and say, sit over there and say, now tell me. No, they lay out everything. But they weren't impressed with the kings of the world. 
They weren't impressed with what they had. They weren't impressed with their privilege. They weren't impressed with his power. They weren't impressed because they weren't after a king. They didn't want company with a king. They wanted the king of kings. So often we get short stopped because we're following God and then we arrive at a place to say, hey, I like it right here. I like what God is doing. I like what I got. I like how it is. But they press past that place of natural comfort because they were being called by God to worship. Worship means to put him first, to give him the highest seat in your heart. Worship means that all things I surrender to the one who I've surrendered all things to. I give my life for him. I give my will for him. My highest and most distinct and defining passion is that I am in pursuit of God. This is how Paul said it. And Paul was educated. Paul was privileged. Paul was studied. Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was trained by Gamaliel. He had something to give up. But Paul's response was that forgetting those things which are behind. Now, he had some stuff behind him, trust me. Well, there's no need to say it. Some of us don't have nothing behind us, so we like, what's up, God? Where you want to go? But when you get some stuff behind you, then you start being Herodian or Herodish, you know. But Paul had some stuff behind him, but he said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards the, for them, they were pressing towards the star that ended up over his house. For what are you pressing towards? What are you in pursuit of? What is defining you right now? What do you got to have? Paul says, forgetting all those things which are behind, I press towards the high mark, I press towards the mark of God, the high calling in Christ. That sounds so nebulous. That sounds so religious. That sounds so, well, what's in it for me-ish? What's in it for you is everything because when God reveals and we pursue, it brings us to a place of reconciliation. These magi were never designed to be magi. These men were true priests. But God had to reconcile them out of where they were, reconcile them out of who they knew themselves to be, and bring them into a place that they really had more authority than the kings, and they had more authority than the priests of their day. Some of you, no, all of you, have more authority than some of the things that you have submitted yourself to. You, you have more revelation than some of the things that you've parked yourself on. You're more than what you see. You think that you're just an astronomer and you're so much more. You think that you're stuck to be right where you are. Well, what's going to move me, Pastor Kevin? Do I need to go back to school and get more education? Do I need to get me some more money? No, you need to worship. It was the journey to pursue Jesus that changed everything. I am what I am because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I am, what, but as they journeyed, what was in their heart changed and their heart became full of, we got to see the king. Just say that, I got to see the king. And not just the king, the king of kings. Look at verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced. Can you see the star today? Can, can you see God lifting up a star today? Can you see God revealing him? The star represented God revealing himself to them. Is God revealing himself to you right now as we're in the scriptures? Can you see? God opened their eyes that they might see and their ears that they might hear and their hearts that they might know. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, are you in the house? When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. When they came in, they didn't see Jesus the king big and in his royal vestments and all this. When they came in, they saw a two-year-old kid who was fragile running around after his mom holding on to her leg. When they came in, they saw a Jesus who was still weak and frail and an infant, well, not an infant, but a toddler running around, stumbling around. That's who they saw, but that's not what they saw. Although to some it was just a toddler, to them they saw the king. 
I'm mentioning that because to some of us, we come and Jesus reveals himself. And when we see him to us, he's just little and weak because I'm after something else. When I see him, he says, oh, yeah, that's cool, but I'm still lukewarm to it. I really don't need it. When I see him, I'm like, little boy, what you going to tell me what to do? And I'm still going to be king over my own life. But when they saw him, they saw him. They were, it's something was revealed to them, and they saw him for who he was. He was what they had passionately pursued, and these grown men got on the ground and worshipped the two-year-old. You got to get that. But were they really worshiping a two-year-old? No, they were worshiping the king of kings. They saw him for what he was. And since they saw him for what he was, it made them be what they were. What were they? You're not magi. You are called to be priests unto our God. And priests take on all forms. They got priests that work as policemen. They got priests that work as mayors. They've got priests that work as business owners. They've got priests that work as mothers, priests that are fathers. But these priests are people who their highest desire is to be before Jesus. And as they're before Jesus and see him for who he is, and they're reconciled back to his plans, back to his purposes, back to his intents, back to harmony, back to agreement, back to compatibility with what he made them to be, then they become what they are. Anything you pursue with passion turns you into something. Only when I pursue Jesus with passion am I turned into what I really am. See, the car that I was trying to get didn't make me. But as I pursue the card I'm trying to get, it makes me all kinds of stuff. I take on odd jobs. I take on weird jobs. I, you know, I do stuff that I don't want to do. I do stuff I'm not made for. I tell a couple of lies. I fill out my credit application with somebody else's social security. Whatever I need to do, I just need to get the car. I borrow money for down payments because in pursuing that car, it made me something. Are you following me? If I pursue women, in pursuing women, it makes me something. I didn't even want to wear these clothes and put on all this cologne, but I'm in pursuit of women, so I did. I took all these dance classes. I got all of it. I, I created an image so that when they see me, they're like, oh, what? Because I was in pursuit of women. I was in pursuit of love, so the woman became all kinds of things to try to get love. But since she tried to get love in all the wrong places, it made her something she wasn't. But we got to be in pursuit of Jesus because since he all things were made by him and nothing was made that was not made by him he was the word wow. and since the word made me when I passionately pursue the word that put on flesh it ends up reconciling me back to what I was and when other people look on me and see a reconciled being they are attracted to that reconciled being and say what were you in pursuit of what have you been after what brought you to that place it happens all the time. Whenever people see glory or what they define as glory, they want to know what you do. If they see me, if, they're into, if, they, if they define glory as a big house with land, when the cable guy comes to my house to work on my cable, he says to me, hey, what do you do for a living? What he's really saying is, what have you been in pursuit of that brought this about in your life? When they come and I go to the bank and, and I tell the banker that I need to get a credit line, but then when the banker looks at how much deposit I have in there, he might ask me, so what exactly does your business do? What he's saying is, how'd you get this glory? I define that as glory. Where'd you get that from? If it's a young boy and I come in and I got on the nines, the Olympic nines of the Jordans, and he's like, where did you find the Olympic nines? And they look brand new. They're not yellowed from the glue or nothing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. And, and I come in with the Olympic nines. He's like, yo, how'd you find them? Where'd you get them? He wants to know, how did you get that glory? And, but when I'm a one who is in pursuit of Jesus, when, when I would travel thousands of miles over years to come and get the privilege to be able to kneel before him, then all of a sudden that makes me something new. When those magi went back home, best believe they weren't the astronomers they were. Best believe they weren't the diviners that they were. When they went home, they started reconciling all of that area of Persia to Christ. Because they had been reconciled, and one who's been reconciled becomes a reconciler. I just want to close on these gifts because I think there's some incredible revealing in these gifts. 
these magi are teaching us what worship looks like. Worship looks like pursuit against all odds. Worship looks like persevering, pressing diligence. I can imagine after the first week, a couple guys have been, how long is this? The star keeps moving. I'm going back to what I knew. I can imagine some said, we've been out here for six months now, Barclocky B. How far are we going? One of them's name was Barclocky B. I just made up. Barclocky B, how far are we going to go to get here? I was with you when the star first showed up. Maybe you read it wrong. Maybe you plotted it wrong. Is that the star we were still looking at? But passionate pursuit makes the wise men keep going. So they're showing us what worship looks like. So not only was their pursuit passionate but the other thing that happened that was so critical for them is and they worship verse 11 they worship them when they had opened their what see everybody that ever saw Jesus open their treasures matter of fact that's how you know somebody saw him because they opened their treasures well, well give me some proof what are, what, are, what are you talking about with that well remember the little boy who had his lunch and he had his, his, his two fish and his five loaves, and he was there. But because the little boy saw Jesus, he gave Jesus his lunch. And Jesus turned his lunch into enough to feed 5,000 and then took the remnants from everything that was left and gave the little boy back not only witness and part of a miracle, but gave the little boy back that and then some. And, and everyone. Whenever anybody sees the king, their response, it provokes gifts. It's, it provokes hollowing what you've seen. Remember when Jesus wanted to enter into the city, and when he went into the city, he told his disciples, go over and you'll see a guy that has a coat that's never been written on. That's like a car that's never been driven before. He says, when you see him, tell him that the master has need of it. And because the man saw Jesus, he gave up his coat that had never been written on because it, whenever I see him, it provokes a response to give. This is worship. When I don't worship, it doesn't provoke a response to give. It just gives me an emotion that felt good, and I go back to what I was. But in my giving, I become. You, you got to get this. Remember when uh, they needed a place to gather for the Last Supper, and Jesus didn't own any property. He had nowhere to do it. But they went in, he said, there's a, there's a man who's already prepared a room for us. Go tell him that the master is needed. Because he saw Jesus, it provoked a giving. When I first saw Jesus, I gave him my life. No, when I first saw him and really saw him, I gave him my life. I said, whatever you want, whatever you need from me, whatever you want to ask for me, I'm crying like, whatever, G, whatever you want, you got it, because I saw him. But we're fasting because over time I lose sight of him. We're fasting because over time I lose passion for him. We're fasting because we need to renew our hearts unto him. And sure enough, when these wise men saw him, they not only prepared themselves, they came and gave what they brought. They gave gold. Why did they give gold? Well, gold is the universal money all around the world. As a matter of fact, if you, they tell you when an economy is failing, buy gold. Because you'll be able to use gold to go to any nation in this world and you can barter with gold. So they coming from that nation, they knew that gold would be valuable in this nation. But by, gold is the precious metal of kings. Economies trade on this. So when they come, they bring gold to the king of kings. It was them acknowledging in their gift that you have rulership over my life. You are king of kings. You rule us. Go. They gave frankincense. Why frankincense? Frankincense is used in the temple. Frankincense is mixed with the anointing oil that the priests use in the temple. Why would they give a baby two years old a gift of frankincense? Can you imagine Mary opening it up and be like, oh, that was, that was nice. <laughs> frankincense. Well, his diapers do smell from time to time. We're just, we're just, I guess they want that for the room. No, but the frankincense, I mean, can you imagine giving a two-year-old's mom frankincense for him? I just got some incense for your baby. What? What you getting incense for my baby for? That's a big joke. I'm going to let it ride. But, um, <laughs> but they brought frankincense because the frankincense was what was burned in the temple in the holy place. And the frankincense was burned in the temple of the holy place. It was said that it represented the worship 
of God. It represented our praise of God. And when the smell that was on the incense that could never go out on the Holy Holies went up into the nostril of God, it gave God great joy and God would descend with his presence. So in reality, by giving the frankincense, what they were saying was we are in the presence of God. We are praising him. We are worshiping him. He's not a two-year-old baby. We are acknowledging that this is the high priest from eternity past to eternity future, and we honor him and we bring him frankincense. This is key. I give him what is valuable to me, my currency. I give him my praise and adoration. Let me tell you, whenever God reveals something to you, start out by giving your praise. Just say thank you. Because your intellect will try to shut it down and figure it out. Just start thanking him. Just start, thank you, Lord. Thank you for revealing that to me. I don't fully understand it. Don't let me rush and try to buckle it down into my little definition. I just thank you. And in that thanks with that frankincense, you can really be in his presence and see what he's saying. Then lastly, and maybe the most offensive gift that they gave to just a mother was myrrh. Myrrh was a spice that was used for embalming. Myrrh would have been, since they did not have the, some of the things that we use now to preserve bodies, they literally embalmed the body with spices so that the smell of the spices would overtake the smell of the rotting flesh. So when they went to embalm someone, myrrh was one of the major spices they used. Why do you give an embalming spice to a two-year-old baby? What are you trying to say? My baby's going to die. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm saying that I recognize that this is the Lamb of God that has come to take away the sins of the world. Not only is he King of Kings, not only is he High Priest, but he is the Lamb that's come to take away our sins. I brought myrrh because I'm honoring the fact that his death is for me. <laughs> I'm honoring the fact that I see these only, but not only am I honoring the fact that his death is for me, I'm also saying I'm ready to die for him. Me traveling this 1,200 miles, standing, I had to meet in that little secret room with Herod, and he brought out all his fancy stuff. We could have died, and plus we're not going to tell this joker where you are, we're leaving. We could die for all of this, but we present myrrh because you're laying down your life. I'm ready to lay down my life too. And unless I'm ready to give him what's valuable to me, unless I'm ready to give thanks and praise and invite in his presence when he reveals to me, unless I'm ready to die for him, I'll never be a true worshiper. If I'm missing one of these gifts, it robs me of my true worship to God, and I'm always clinging to one and trying to hold on to the other. I'm always loving one and despising another. I never can be that place where I'm fully in adoration. But I'm telling you, as we go into this Reconcile 2015 fast, get your gifts ready. Get ready to journey to go into his presence. Get ready to fight through some adversity, but also get ready to come before the king. Some people might be around you at the end of the fast, not only still see a two-year-old baby, but others will lay before him because they see the king. Are you ready to live this? No, are, are you ready to live this? Are we ready to become worshipers? Are we ready to be reconciled? Are we ready to become reconcilers? Let me read in closing because we're ready, we, we can live it. I just want to read in closing um, about this fast. It'll be up on the web, but I just want to walk you through the introductory part of it. It says, the overall purpose in fasting is to turn our attention away from ourselves and our own self-contrived pursuits to turn to God and his will for our lives. Fasting and prayer intensifies our desire for God while releasing us from habits and patterns of thought that hinder God's desire for our lives. And then it lays out the five specific purposes of our fast. And the kind of fast that we're gonna do, we're gonna do a sun up to sun down fast. So that means each day at six o'clock, I stop eating and I 6 a.m. and I just go to drinking water and drinking fruit juice. And I'm in prayer throughout the day, instant prayer, frequent prayer, 
persistent prayer. And then at 6 p.m. each day, I break fast, and then I can have a meal. Make it moderate, please. Then, then I can have a meal and begin to talk about and share what has happened during my day of the fast. And we're going to do that for seven days straight, from 6 to 6, and then a time with people to fellowship and share and pray. And at the end of that, God has declared, and I'm in agreement with him and believing that our hearts are going to be entirely ready to be reconciled to him and us to be as ambassadors reconciling others to him throughout this year. So I'm ready to live that.